Hey, good morning. Welcome to Journey Church today. We are so thankful you're here. Once you turn to somebody beside you, tell them welcome to church this morning. Stand to your feet. Let's get ready to sing together today. Come on.
love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant come on I'm calling on the God of
sing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Give him praise in this place. Aren't you grateful for the faithfulness of God this morning? Man, I'm so grateful that we can look back over history and see generations and generations of the faithfulness of God in the way that he moved in power and answered prayers. And he offered hope. And today that same God through Jesus offers us hope because of the gospel. So as we sing this next song, Jesus over everything, let's lift up his name above every other name, the only one who can save, the only one who can offer us true living hope today, amen.
beautiful morning we've had already. What a great reminder that is today. In fact, we want to welcome you here for this first of a very special holiday season at Journey. Um, I know a lot of you all have already been celebrating the holidays because how many of you will admit that your Christmas tree is already up? Your lights, look around people. These are my people right here. <laughs> Uh, you would get along really well in the Newsome household because we are ready for Christmas. Uh, but we are so glad that you're here because as we enter this season of the holidays, as we head towards Christmas, we're reminded in this season that God sent Jesus to us. Literally, God came to be with us. Think about that for just a minute. And this song gives us such a powerful reminder of an important truth today, that Jesus was sent fully God, but he also was sent fully man. And because he was sent as fully man, he can identify with you this morning. In fact, the first two lines of that song tell us that he came from glory, he took on flesh to save the lost. Think about that today. God chose to take on this frail human body. And Jesus looks at you this morning and he says, because I did that, because I became fully man, I see you. I understand you. I can sympathize with you today. In fact, here's how Hebrews 2.18 tells us. It says, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So Jesus is fully man. He understands your suffering. He understands your grief and your hurt because he experienced them himself. Doesn't that give you comfort this morning that you can bring your hurts to Jesus because he gets you, he is there. But the second part of that powerful truth for us today is he wasn't just fully man, he was fully God with the power of almighty God on him. And because he's fully God, it means that he comes to you today, not only to sympathize with you, but he can help you. He can help you this morning because he is fully God, Jesus over everything. In fact, Psalm 145 says this, it says, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. I don't know what you came in here today struggling with. Maybe God feels very far away from you, but I wanna tell you the truth today is that if you will call on Jesus, he is there, he is near you today. He sees you, he loves you, he has compassion on you, he identifies with you. And we as a church believe that there is power in the name of Jesus. So when you call on his name, he is there to answer you and to meet you right where you are. You don't have to get it all figured out to come to him. He's there to meet you. Aren't you thankful for that this morning, church? Come on, let's celebrate that today. Well, we're so glad you're here, especially if you're a visitor. I'm gonna ask, would you just turn around to you, say hi to one or two people around you, and then you can be seated this morning. My name is Danielle and I'm on the ministry team here at Journey and I'd like to say a very special hello and welcome to those of our church family who watch all the time online. Thank you for joining us today. And if you're in the room today, especially if you're a guest, thank you so much for being our guest today. We are honored that you're here. Um, at Journey, we have a core belief in generosity because we believe that you cannot outgive God. And this is the time in our service where those of us who are part of the Journey family worship through how we give today. And because we believe you cannot outgive God, we as a church take the first 15% of everything that you give, we take it in and we give it back out all over the world to global impact, to local impact here in our community, to our multiplying ministries like church planning. And so when you give here, it makes a difference all over the world, which is really neat. But a significant part of your giving 
goes to impact our community because we believe that we are not just a church in our community, but we are a church for our community. And yesterday as a church family, so many of you joined us, you came together and you helped us as we did our Thanksgiving meal distribution. And here's the impact of your giving. We gave away over 250 meals to families in need and we delivered 100 more additional meals out into the community to families in need. Because of the way you've been faithfully giving, we were able to buy food and supplies and gift cards for these Thanksgiving meals. And here's a really, really cool uh, story. 338 of those boxes, those meals went to families who have never been to Journey. That's the impact that you're having in this community. Come on, let's put our hands together. Yes, that is something we're celebrating today. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being faithful, especially when sometimes we look out at the world and it feels scary. When you're faithful to be generous and to do what God says to do, we really believe that he shows up and he will show himself to you in those moments. So we encourage you, keep being faithful, keep being generous because God always blesses it. And we're so excited to see what he's doing through your giving here at Journey. Hey, would you pray with me before we go on to the next part of our service? Lord, thank you so much. God, just for the opportunity to come together today, Lord, I pray that you would bless the giving of our people here. Lord, those who are giving maybe a little fearfully, I pray that you would increase their faith. Those who experience, Lord, the gift and the blessing of giving back to you because it's all yours anyways. Lord, I pray that you'd increase their faith. And God, take what's given here to just make a difference in our world, to make a difference in our community, that people would know that Jesus loves them, that he's for them and that he cares. I pray you bless our service today. Meet every heart exactly where they are in this moment this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Journey. I'm Alex. And I'm Kylie. Thank you for spending your morning with us. Here at Journey, we exist to see people far from God become passionate Christians who make a difference in the world. If you're a first time guest or you just wanna stay connected, you can fill out a connection card located in the seat pocket in front of you. Be sure to stop by the Connection Center to turn in your completed card. For every connection card we receive, we will make a $10 donation to World Help's relief efforts in Ukraine. Every dollar donated goes towards helping displaced Ukrainians receive food, shelter, and clothing. At Journey, we believe everyone has the next step spiritually. Grow Track is our monthly four step process that is designed to help you take next steps in your relationship with Jesus and to reach your full potential. Today in step three, you'll discover how God wants to use your influence for Jesus to make a difference, not just that journey, but in your family and in your workplace as well. If you can't make it at 1030 this week, join us next week for step four. If you have recently made a spiritual decision, we want to celebrate with you. Join us next Sunday, November 27th for our best day ever party. For more information and to sign up, visit our events page on our website or the JCI app. You can stay updated with all of our events here at Journey by downloading the Journey app or following us on social media. We hope you enjoy your time here. Now let's get ready for the next message. Yeah! journey. Hey, can you help me welcome Daniel and Brittany Brooker back to Kansas City and back to journey. Guys, it is so good to have you here. Before we dig into their story a little bit, uh, let me say this. Happy Thanksgiving to you all this week. If you're traveling, be safe. Um, if you're hosting, be sane. Uh, those would be like my two challenges over Thanksgiving. Hey, the best time to begin to have impact at Christmas uh, is it Thanksgiving? So when you leave today, we're going to put um, a little bag of three business cards in your hand. They give you an opportunity to invite your family to celebrate Christmas at Journey with you. Begin thinking of your Christmas plans now, specifically when you're going to celebrate Jesus at Christmas, because you may not have looked yet, but the Chiefs play the Seahawks at noon on Christmas Eve at Arrowhead. 
And some of you are going to forget to come to church because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you to watch that game at noon. So we got services on Thursday. We got services on Friday. We also have services on Christmas Eve. But we'll put those in your hands as you leave today. Um, and then maybe the most important part of this weekend we did yesterday. We recorded a podcast yesterday that we'll drop two weeks before Christmas called Hurt, Hope, and Blended Families for the Holidays. We very specifically addressed how do you celebrate um, a holiday when you're mourning, when you're walking through grief. When is it okay to turn the page and have hope? Uh, and for the large, many of you who are living in blended families, how do you deal with the in-laws and outlaws of family well when you got a bunch that have crashed into each other? So we'll drop that. We'll let you know. We'll send you an email reminder two weeks before Christmas to get you and your friends and family who've been having these discussions um, to get ready. I think it'll be really, really good. It's going to be highly impactful. Um, Daniel and Brittany, thank you again for joining us on your Thanksgiving week um, to come back to Kansas City. Uh, they were here in 2019 to share their story, which we will not tell in detail again other than to say this. Um, Brittany's husband, uh, late husband Patrick, died when she was 25, leaving her with three kids under three, one of them who was a baby. Um, Daniel's wife, uh, Lindsay, died when he was 30, leaving him with two adopted children under the age of five. Uh, a couple years later, they met each other. They would get married. They would not just begin this blended family, but God would call them to this ministry of sharing their story of grief and grace. And in 2019, they walked us through that story. Just tell us how you survived and how those of us walking through loss can survive. It was incredible. We won't reshare that entire story today. If you follow Journey on social, this week we dropped in the link to that 2019 interview. For some of you, that probably is the message you need. So thank you for enduring with this message. But today you are in the days of pain, not the days of purpose. And you're still trying to figure out how do I make it till tomorrow. So if that's you, go back this week on our social, find the link to that 2019 interview and, and hear in depth the story of loss um, and moving forward. Because for some of you, that's the message you need to hear. Because we're three years down the road um, in life and in our country, and you guys have had another baby, um, which has been awesome, six kids now at home, uh, I hope today to move the conversation from pain to purpose. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to look at scripture today that tells us there is purpose in our pain, and then we're going to ask people who have experienced it if that's true. The New Testament talks about two different types of knowledge that followers of Jesus can have. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about the Bible know the New Testament was written in Greek, not English. One of the Greek words for knowledge in the New Testament is the word gnosis. It, it literally is defined and means knowledge. It means something that you are taught that you know in your head. The better term for knowledge in the New Testament is the Greek word epinosis, which means it's not something you know from being taught. It's something you know from living through it. It's knowledge through experience. What we're going to talk with Daniel and Brittany about today is the Bible teaches us that we can know there's pain in our purpose. Has that been true for you? And how can that be true for us? How can we make that not what we've been taught from the Bible but our experience in life. So that's our hope today. Before we ever dig into scripture, we always pray and ask God to prepare our hearts. So um, if you're here or if you're watching online, let's just pray real quick and ask God to get us ready to receive today. God, we ask you through your word and your Holy Spirit to open our hearts so that we might receive what you have for us today. You've told us that there is purpose in pain. Now, God, as we hear how that's been true for Daniel and Brittany, may you show us how that can be true for us, and may this day be a huge day of purpose in our journey of pain for the ministry that's ahead of us. We love you, and Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said... Amen. Let me say a quick word of welcome to those of you who are watching online. This is one of those services that your friends are going to watch on Sunday, and then they're going to send you because they're thinking about you while they're in the service. So if somebody forwarded you this link and you're watching it because you're going through a difficult season, we're really grateful that you found this today. Um, Daniel, I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 because that's one of the first places in the New Testament where we hear 
the apostles of the New Testament say, there's some things God does for you specifically so you can do them for others. The scripture will be on the screen so that those of you who don't have a Bible can read along with me. If you do have a Bible and want to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and underline, please feel free to do that. But here's what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He said, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Some translations in English say afflictions so that we can comfort those in any trouble or affliction with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. The promise of Scripture is that God doesn't waste what we go through, that he helps us through it, but then he wants us to help others through it. As you guys have walked through this season, how have you experienced this to be true in how others used the comfort God gave them to help you and how now God is able to use what you have gone through to help others. And, and how can we begin to think about how God might use our things to help others in pain? Yeah, I mean, that, that's such an important question. Um, these verses shaped the direction of my journey in a really important way. Um, but before I share that, I just want to pause for a minute, guys. I, this is such a special church in our hearts, a spe special moment um, in our journey, and Christian and Danielle are such a huge part of our story. I just want to show them honor and show them love. They've stepped into our story. Danielle showed up in Brittany's story before I was ever part of it and has stayed with us, so I don't, I don't want to move past that without showing you guys honor uh, that you deserve and that, that God gets the glory for. So, I don't know, is it okay if I just ask you guys to honor them with me with just a hand clap? Is that okay? <laughs> Thank y'all. So your question, you know, the interesting thing about this passage is um, as I walked through my journey of loss, you know, I, uh, my 28-year-old wife died from cancer, 10-year battle. So I'm going through this entire uh, everything's upside down moment of asking God why. I remember in the car, windows down, yelling out, God, why? Why is this my story? Why is this what happened? And there was a transition to where a still, small, quiet voice began to put in my heart to say, ask what? Well, what do I do with this? I don't, I'm not getting the answer to my why, so what? And I was drawn to this passage for that very reason in that season of God comforting me because I was experiencing that even though I had a lot of questions. And then I realized, oh, wait, even while I have questions, because God has comforted me in all of my afflictions and my troubles, I can comfort others in any of theirs. I don't, want to, I don't want us to miss that. I can't, it's not limited to just widowers that have children in the home. God allows me to speak in other lives because of that street credit, if you will. Like, I know what it feels like to have everything taken away. It feels like and everything go the wrong way, and it seems. But having the ability to comfort people as an encourager, even in my darkest days, that brought life to me and encouraged me. And here's the crazy part is when I said yes to that, to comforting others, primarily widowers, I was helping. I basically said, I'm going to help guys. And in return, long story short, I met Brittany from that. So you don't say, hey, how do I meet a girl? Let me help some dudes and see what happens. <laughs> but God is in those yeses. You give him your yes. You give him open-handed prayers. There's answers that are so much bigger than I, even I expected. So this passage really shifted everything from my why, God, to what, and in that response, I've seen a whole new stage of season of my life that I never saw coming. So, Brittany, we, we live in cycles of seven biblically. Um, so you're now moving through the seventh year at the end of this first cycle of, you know, from a widow to remarried to a new baby. What are you learning in your journey of God comforting you so you can comfort others? And how has that, how has that been true for you? And now how's that? How's that working from you that we can learn from? Yeah. You know, I think the comfort of God is something that has to be accepted. You know, we say, you know, God's word promises that he's a comfort to us, but there are many people walking around without comfort because they haven't accepted the comfort that God gives. And we can, we can reject it with bitterness saying this is not the story I wanted. And I can't tell you how many times I sat there and I said, why God? Why did you call me to this? Why did you call my babies to this? And I was comforted to know, like, even Jesus on the cross said, why have you forsaken me? Job is called a righteous man. And all throughout the um, book of Job in the Bible, he asked the question, why? 
So when we go to God in those raw moments and when we ask those questions, honestly, intimacy happens with the Lord there of saying, this is where I'm at. I'm not coming to you together. I'm coming broken. And God, would you meet me here in the midst of that? And that is where we receive the comfort of God, when we go to him in those broken moments. You know, all of us have heard the subject that people say, hurt people what? Hurt people. But we believe through scripture that God has called us that hurt people can actually help people. We don't have to live in that identity that you can project your pain, project your bitterness, your unforgiveness, your self-pity that so often come creep in in our pain and become the idols that we cling to in our pain. So we can cling to the comfort of God, his perspective, the hope of eternity, or we can cling to our pain and our self-pity and our sin in that. You know, our generation says there's no wrong way to grieve, but I'm telling you there is a wrong way to grieve and God's word says there's a wrong way and I have grieved wrong. I'm Brittany and I'm broken and I've been in pain and I have not done everything right, but praise the Lord. It doesn't say that his faithfulness is based on our faithfulness. It says his faithfulness is eternal from generation to generation. It does not waver. And so we can go to the faithfulness of God. We can go to his comfort. We can go to his word and trust that he will meet us in the midst of it if only we turn to him for the comfort. That's so good. So oftentimes, like you're saying, I can use my story and I can lean into someone else to comfort them. But what about for those of us in the room who we know someone who's experienced death or loss, they're grieving or they're suffering in some way or they know someone who is and they want to help. So often we back up because we're afraid that we're going to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing. So can you guys share this, some examples of how people showed up in your stories, how they ministered to you in your grief and give us some tips, like what can we do? What can we say to people who might be in a season of grieving or hurting to minister to them? Yeah, that's, I think the, I think people are paralyzed by not knowing what to do. That very question causes them to pause and not do anything. And not doing anything is extremely painful on the receiving end or the lack of receiving of that. You know, you may think of somebody right now that's your inner circle, somebody that you really have counted on and you went through something hard and they didn't show up. It's not that they didn't love you. It's not that they didn't want to. They just probably didn't know what to do. And so they just chose not to. I would, I would encourage you guys to, one, give them grace, forgiveness. Uh, you know, unforgiveness, it, it only ruins you. It's like drinking poison, expecting them to be hurt by it. Um, but it's the, under, the understanding that this is hard. This is hard. If you are a visual person, what helps me, I like things in really simple terms. And I look at things as circles around your story. If you're in the inner circle, you know it. And you have, I would say, a responsibility to push past the awkward and show up. There's no right words. Um, there's a lot of wrong words, and that's why we hesitate. Just show up. Maybe that's all you need to do. I've got a widower friend of mine. He's a pastor. And so people are nervous about saying the right or wrong thing. Is it, is it scripturally based? Is it theologically correct? And he said, I just asked my friends the day after my wife died to just sit with me. That's all they did. They sat for hours with him on his porch, and that's all he needed. So don't think that you have to have the answer. You don't. But showing up. So if you're in the inner circle, just, just walk in the door. Show up and do what you need to do. If you're on the next layer out, the extended family, the friends that know each other, see each other every now and then, well, then look for practical ways. What can I do outside the home? Can I take care of the yard? Can I have somebody hire a cleaning company to take care of their house? Can I do something for them that's not invasive? That's an op option as well. If you're in the community, there are things you can do like create moments for them. If you want to go as elaborate as, hey, here's... Here's an Airbnb for the weekend. Here's a cabin. Go away with your family and just enjoy some rest time. There's all kinds of ways. But I will say, and you talked about this before, is don't let that limit the Holy Spirit. You know, that may help you, guide you, inner circle, next layer, community. But if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, guys, you got to do it. Like the scariest thing is not obeying the voice of God and the regret that comes with that and the missed opportunity to bless somebody. Like, I don't want to live in that place of I should have shown up, but I was too scared to do it. So there's some guidance, but I think it really comes down to are you listening to the Holy Spirit and what he prompts you to do? What would you say is an example of something that happened in your life or story maybe where someone showed up and it was just administered to you at the time you needed it? Yep. 
I think it's so um, important in our midst of our grieving to remember that it is God and his hands and feet that are loving on us through people. And I got to experience it over and over again in our life. One example, my kids were all sick. You know, this is months after my husband went to be um, with the Lord. I, I live alone with all these little tiny people and all they would eat was apples. So we ran out of apples and I'm like, I'm not loading kids with all these fevers throwing up to go get apples. And literally my doorbell rings and this lady shows up and she goes, this is so weird, but I'm just going to be honest that it's weird. Um, God told me to bring you a bag of apples. And so here's a bag of apples. And I just start crying. And I thought, if God can do those little itty bitty things and he can show us that he cares, like he sees it all and he knows. But if she hadn't pressed past that awkwardness to bring those bag of apples, I wouldn't have gotten to experience the literally specific ways that God shows up. All of us are not called to make a meal. All of us are not called to show up in these big ways. But what we can do is we can pray. We can be an encourager. We can send them scripture and say, I'm praying this over your heart right now when you may not have the ability to pray it yourself. Like, I'm believing it with you. So whatever you're called to as the body of Christ, just obey whatever the Lord tells you. I just had a similar emotional reaction when Chick-fil-A gift cards showed up at my door. <laughs> yeah. The dude version. <laughs> Hugs, tears, all of it. I was going to say, so, some people based on their spiritual gifts should not make a meal. <laughs> they should send Chick-fil-A gift cards. Just saying. Um, to, to help illustrate how, like, how sincerely awkward this is. Um, so like, so I'm, a, I'm a pastor who's been doing this nearly 25 years. And as we started our podcast last night, um, I said, hey, before we begin, what do I call your, for, your former spouse, your first spouse, your, like, those people? Like, how do I, how do I say that? in a way that's not offensive and okay with you. And they said, well, you could, you could call them their names. Um, like Patrick and Lindsay, we, like those are their names. You can call them their names and talk about them like they were people because they are. He said, sometimes we call each other the wrong names. When Daniel last night called Brittany Lindsay at dinner, it made me feel so good. Pastor, said, oh, that was confidential. Gosh. Isn't there like yeah, some rule uh, on that? <laughs> confidential for us and everyone in the world who's watching online. Um, call but it, it, it is, yeah, it's just, you. You don't want to do the wrong thing, and you don't even know how to ask the weird question. Oswald Chambers, in his great devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, has a day where he said the Holy Spirit works the ministry of intercession through what seems like random thoughts at random times. What does that mean? If you're driving down the road at a random time and you're thinking of a random person, it's not random at all. God literally wants you to get the bag of apples. Random thoughts at random times for Christians are the ministry of intercession. Stop and pray. Stop and send a text. Don't think, wonder why I'm thinking about that random person at this random time. If you are a Christian, do something about that random thought at the random time because it's not random at all. That could be a, just a great first step for you to respond to those seemingly random things that are God moments in the lives of people who are hurting. Um, the next scripture I want to look at is... It's a great verse in the Bible that I think is, is poorly timed in its use most times. So Romans 8, 28 uh, is a verse that's true, um, and it means so much, but I don't know that it should be the first verse we use in our first text to someone who's grieving, maybe in our first conversation, maybe not in the first year, but we do. So often... Because we're uncomfortable with grief, we try to clean it up as fast as we should. It says this in Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I know you don't want to hear on day one, God's going to use it for good. Because it's so bad. However, this verse promises, and if we were to read further in the text, the good that God is doing is he's continuing to reveal himself and his love to us. He's, he uses everything in life, the good and the bad. Not that God makes everything good, but God uses everything in life to draw us towards himself so we understand how much he loves us. How have you seen this true in your story? And when, when were you able to receive God? God can use this. God will use this. God is using this. And it's not good, but but what God has allowed me to see of him is very, very good. It hit me the other day as I was talking to 
um, our kids. So she brought three boys into the marriage. I brought two, a boy and a girl, little Lulu, um, to bring in the whole crew. And I was talking to the boys, her boys, about eternity, about Daddy Patrick, and, and talking through what that looked like. And I realized that I was helping prayers that Patrick prayed over his kids, over his boys, come true. I was walking with them with prayers that he had prayed over them years before. And if I had not gotten out of my own way, if I had not taken steps, and they were baby steps, be it small steps towards hope and towards healing, if I just sat in it indefinitely, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to love these boys, to help these boys see the hope of heaven as well. And God provides, God takes care of them. But what an honor that just by choosing hope and listening to God's word and taking them at his word gave me an opportunity to walk these boys through grief and pain and and just that concept of heaven. What an honor to say that healing looks like helping others too. If I had sat in it, I would have missed those opportunities. And so experiencing that has just been so life-giving to say, it is worth it. This is hard work, guys. I mean, we're sitting up here talking to you about where we've come. It's, it's not easy. I don't ever want to assume that, hey, this is just keep going another step. Like, yes, it's steps, but it is hard. And you need people in your life to remind you that it's going to be hard, but it's worth it to see those three boys talk about heaven now. And to be a part of those conversations, the only way I'm in that room is if I choose healing and choose to take God at his word. So I don't want you, you guys to miss what is in front of you, what's going on now, and miss out on what's down the road and could be to come. There's good things ahead. This whole idea of the best is yet to come, it is true if our eyes are on heaven. It's an insult if we only look in front of us. And so that's been the shift in my heart to say, God, you have been present. You have, you have given grace upon grace in my journey and allow me to still see really, really good things that help me through this journey. I just think the goodness of God is not measured in circumstances and it's not measured in things that we can see with our eyes. You know, scripture says we don't look at the things that we see because those are temporary, but the things that we don't see are eternal and last forever. It also says this affliction that we go through, it, the, it will outweigh the eternal weight of glory that will be greater than the affliction. Right now, your affliction that you're walking through feels so heavy and so weighty, and it may feel like this will never outweigh. None of us would sit here and say, we, we would pick our story over again. No, I'm human and nobody picks pain. <laughs> or maybe y'all are more godly than me, but I would not pick pain. Nobody wants to experience that. So we don't have a choice picking our circumstance that we were dropped in. We have a choice of how we steward the circumstance we were dropped in. We can either look and see, you know what? My life is not good. Look at all these things I've gone through. Or I can say, look at the goodness of God, even though all of the things that we walk through. Goodness of God isn't measured with things that we see. It's measured in who he is in the presence of Jesus. In Psalms 27, it says, I would have despaired unless I believed. It didn't say that I knew, that I felt, that I saw it, but that I believed I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Not the land of the dead, but the land of the living. And sometimes we just have to believe, God, there is going to be goodness in the midst of this. I don't know how it's going to be, but I'm going to find the goodness in Jesus. You know, the goodness of our life is not that we got married. It's not that we had a baby. Because I'm telling you, there's so much suffering that we go behind scenes that we could tell you about all day that y'all would never know about. The goodness is the treasure in the darkness of who Jesus is to us the treasure of knowing him because of the hard things. I would not know the Lord in the way that I know him as my refuge and my strength and my strong tower, my fortress, the one who I trust. It says in um, Psalms 121, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who neither slumbers nor sleeps. Behold Israel, he's on your right hand. Wherever you go, he is there. And I wouldn't know God as my help unless we needed help. You don't know God as your refuge unless you need refuge. But so often we go to ourselves for refuge or we project it on other people because someone didn't show up or because someone didn't do that. I am in discomfort. Well, no, we've got to turn and say, Jesus, you are my comfort, not people, not circumstances. But I will look in the land of the living and believe I will see the goodness of God in Jesus himself. 
That's so good. It's so powerful. You know, one thing I noticed about you guys yesterday is, and I've noticed this before, is as we were recording the podcast, you guys reference scripture and you quote scripture all the time. And in a day and age where statistics tell us that most Christians don't regularly read God's word, um, you guys have a history of growing up in the church that you put God's word in your heart, or you came later to faith, you put God's word in your heart, and now in your time of suffering and grief, you were able to tap into what was in there. So what's a word that you would give to those in this room today about knowing and treasuring God's word? Maybe it's for the future. Maybe for it's, it's what you will go through one day. And for those are grie- that are grieving currently, how can God's word be a ministry to them? And how was it for you guys? You know, people will say a lot of things to try to comfort us. And they are kind and we appreciate people. But they don't have life. Their words don't have life. And so you can try to muster the right things to say. But I'm telling you, when you go to the word, it has everything that we need for life and godliness. And this has the living, breathing perspective that I need for my earthly pain that feels so consuming. I can hardly even look straight. And so I think in the midst of my suffering, I found that the word became life and bread. Because I'm telling you, if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have had hope. Because all around me felt hopeless. It felt hard. I was tucking my babies in, and they would be crying about, Daddy, why can't we go to heaven? Why can't I just die? And you're thinking, oh my word, I can't believe we're having these conversations at three. And then I would get in my living room and just lay before God and say, I cannot do this unless you come. Jesus, would you just come? Would you meet me in this? And I would take his word at his word and say, you promised to be a father to the fatherless. You promised to be near to the brokenhearted. You promised to be my refuge. You promised to be the way maker. God, would you come and do this? And just like sometimes in that feist, you know, like you better come through. (laughs) And I'm telling every time that we are broken and contrite before the Lord and we say, God, we don't have it, but you have it. He will come and meet us in our brokenness and in our pain. Psalms 119, the entire passage talks about the power of the word of God. It says it's better than bread. It's better than honey. It's better than anything that we could ever imagine. It's our counselor. It's our greatest treasure. And I do believe that the word of God is our greatest treasure. David said, I would have perished in my affliction if it wasn't for the word of God. And um, I used to read that and I would be like, wow, David, you are quite dramatic. Really? (laughs) Perish in your affliction. Like that's dramatic language. But I'm telling you, I would have perished in my affliction if it wasn't for the word. And I didn't always have the strength to read the word. Sometimes I'd be in those hard moments. I had that little newborn and feeding him in the middle of the night. And I would say, God, would you bring your word to mind? Sometimes he brought a song that I had heard when I was four. And I would sing that over and over again. That same line because I needed that truth. Sometimes I would play music because I did not even have the strength to sing the songs myself. But worship is a weapon and the word is a weapon against the lies of the enemy. And so when we proclaim the truth of God's word that doesn't return void, it literally pierces our heart in every area. And it can give us the perspective that we need. And I'm telling you, five seconds in the presence of God and the word of God does more than five generations. It can change forever, but it happens through the power of the word of God if we go. So man, you can grow numb in so many areas when you're in pain, but do not grow numb in your walk with the Lord. We need it. So often we say, I'm in a dry season. I don't hear from God, but it's because we are not going to God. We try to run this marathon of pain on one sip of water and we wonder why our mouth is dry and why we feel like we're dying. It's because we are not going to the water, the well that never returns dry for our satisfaction. The world says, oh, you can do this in your own strength. You can got this. You go to therapy, whatever. No, we can actually go to the living water, Jesus, for our satisfaction, and everything we need is in him. Colossians 3 says, in him is all things and all things hold together. So you feel like you're falling apart, go to him, and he will hold you together. Daniel, you were sharing too. Hang on. (laughs) I don't... I don't know that your answer matters after that. (laughs) But you could also answer that question if you wanted to. In the early service, I told Brittany, the three of us can leave if you'd like us to, and we'll get you a podium. One of my friends after service said, if that Carrie Underwood girl comes and starts a church in Kansas City, (laughs) his word's not mine. He said, I'm going to her church, not yours. So stay in Georgia. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I would just ask you the same thing. Like, how did God's word, and in the previous service, you talked about worship as well. Just share with us what God's word and worship did in your story. And you have to quote as many verses as Brittany. <laughs> I, I married her for a reason. She's amazing. Amazing. Um, you know, there's several things that, that you said. On, all of it is powerful. And there's something, something that stood out to me that you're talking about was worship, right? Um, worship is something that I don't want us to overlook as an option. It's something that is just part of it. Uh, I was recently serving at a widower's retreat a couple weeks ago. And I had, uh, I had a perspective of all these guys. There was, you know, 20-some widowers all in one room. And we were worshiping together. Some of these guys were pastors. Some of these guys, um, you know, had grown up in the church the whole life. And they told me after this was the first time they had worshiped in a long time. And I see these guys who had lost the most important person in their life, the one they chose for life. And they're raising their hands in worship. And I could just sit back and, and just acknowledge the fact that they're doing the same thing as their wives in heaven. The, the script... Let's get, get in the word. Let's yeah, get in the word. Yeah. Let me pull my reference here up, guys. <laughs> but Ephesians talks about how all things are united in him, things in heaven and things in earth. And, you know, I went through that same journey. 30 days after my, Lindsay went home to heaven, I went through this, this, I don't know, this desperation for a connection that I knew I would never have again in, in the way that I had known it. And I finally found myself worshiping for the first time. And I realized in that moment, that was my connection with Lindsay. She was worshiping God in heaven and me doing the same thing is something that we had in common. So as I'm watching these guys two weeks ago worshiping, because that's about all they could do. And some were not even singing. They had their hands up and we were singing for them. That worship is an absolute weapon that resets our perspective. And like I mentioned, it's not about what's in front of us. It's what's ahead of us, what's up above. The hope of heaven allows us to worship or have somebody come alongside you and worship for you and with you until you can do the same. But that perspective shift changes everything. And like Brittany said, it's all here in the word. There's an interesting verse in First Peter, section of verses that talk about how one, of our most, how one of the most valuable things we can do when we suffer is remember that Jesus suffered and how Jesus suffered. So I want to read this verse and just ask how this has been true to you. This is the gnosis of the Word of God. Your story, I think, is the epinosis of the Word of God. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 19, it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. And I want to stop right there. When your spouse dies at 25 or 75, unjust suffering. You didn't deserve that. You didn't ask for that. Most of us could not have prevented that. Unjust suffering. When the diagnosis comes for one of your children, when you lose the job, um, when tragedy strikes on the highway, unjust suffering. Please hear this. It's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust sufferings because they're conscious of God, because they want to honor God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? And if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable for God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Peter said, listen, sometimes you suffer because you got it wrong, and it's the consequence. But there's a lot of times it's unjust. You didn't deserve it. And, and that's the type of suffering Jesus had. He didn't deserve it. But how he suffered and that he suffered, Peter said, helps us. How, how did reflecting on the suffering of Jesus and the reality that he suffered help you move through your suffering? I love that part in the passage where it says that he entrusted himself to a God who judges justly. I think sometimes times we have questions. I have questions that I will never know the answer to. I have to bring my three little boys to the heart doctor all the time because they may have a genetic thing that could make them drop dead from a heart thing and we don't know. And I will never know the answers to those questions. There, there are whys that we will never know the answer and I have to trust my story to a God who judges justly. 
I have to say, God, I entrust you with my story. God, I don't want to be stuck in my pain because I'm so consumed with it. I want to walk in freedom towards the calling that you have for me. And also, I mean, he gives us a great example in that. How many times in our grief and pain, again, do we want to project the pain on other people? Or maybe you're jealous of a life that somebody has of ease that you don't have and you know you'll never have. My life is not simple like it used to be. And we can often in scripture, you know, the children of Israel, after they went through to the promised land, they kept looking back to Egypt. It's not that they went back to Egypt and actually were worshiping the people, you know, the things of Egypt, but they went back to their Egypt and their heart and their mind. And that's where they got stuck. You may not be going back to that season or that person or whatever, but you're going back over and over again in our heart. And we make an idol of that where we can't fully go forward to the calm that God's given us. And we don't want to be stuck in the jealousy and the pain. We want to see God's example in that and say, man, God, I want to walk in obedience the way you did. It said he didn't revel against it. And that means to criticize in an abusive way, to angrily insult manner. How many people have you guys met that walk in a room and the aroma that walks with them is bitterness because of the pain they've been in? We've all been walking in those rooms where everyone can smell that. But then you see the people that have been crushed with their pain and that they come out with aroma of Christ and they don't become bitter, they become better because of the choice that they made to choose Jesus. The difference is not us. The difference is not us in a different set of circumstances. The difference is Jesus in those circumstances, us running to him and us following his example in suffering to say, Jesus, I wanna do it like you help me, God. Show me how to do this. <laughs> You know, the, 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 what do I say, guys? I don't know. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I realized in this, and thank you so much for just bringing the truth to that, um, as a caregiver, so some of you guys may be or may have been caregivers, and there's a journey and a process with that. And also a husband, guys, we want to fix everything. We, if it's broken, we'll fix it. Um, and that was my mentality, just like most of you guys is, if there's something broken, I'm gonna fix it. I'm a provider in this sense. So when Lindsay got sick, I took that mentality in and realized very quickly that I could not fix anything. There was a, a limit to my, my help. And you may have said this, or you may have thought this, but I thought, I wish I could take this burden for Lindsay. I would trade places with her in a heartbeat. I would carry her cross of cancer for her, but I knew I couldn't. And as I think about the cross, not only did Jesus want to and was willing to take this cross, this burden of sin that we, uh, that belonged to us, but he can and did do that. So it revealed in my heart my um, limited ability to help, and it revealed that in Christ there is an unlimited ability to help. He didn't just want to, but he did take that burden of sin from us and bore the cross for us. So to have somebody, a relationship with Christ that trust him completely and to realize no, not only does he want to step in, he did. And that changes my whole story. It changes everything. So I think as we walk through it, if you have cared for someone, if there's something you realize you can't fix, that should draw our hearts to Jesus, the one that actually can and does fix that. That's the hope of Jesus. The hope of Jesus is that the grave is not the end of your story. That death is not the end of story because heaven is ahead. Jesus came to make a way so that we wouldn't suffer forever. Amen. I am so thankful that one day there will be a day where all the tears we be wiped away. All the pain and all the sorrow and the road we walk of joint sorrow will be gone and will be forever in the presence of Jesus, forever worshiping God free of the pain of this earth. And because of what Jesus did and how he made a way in the cross, we can have that living hope that says at the grave with my boys, I can say, daddy is more alive now than ever because of the gift of Jesus. That was not the end of his story. That's not the end of our story. And we can cling to the hope. But so often we get stuck looking at the grave looking at our pain, that we miss looking up to heaven and the hope, the living hope that overcomes the death. There are people in this room that are alive but dead inside because you have not experienced the living hope that we have. And I'm telling you, we, we've been through too much for it to be wasted, and I've seen the goodness of God too powerful to be silent. 
I will not be silent in the goodness of God because we've experienced that he is the treasure in the darkness, that he is the joy in the midst of the sorrow, and he is the living hope even when you're walking through death, even when you're walking through a story, a lonely story, a silent suffering that nobody sees on the outside. There are people that nobody knows what you're walking through in this room, but I'm telling you, God does. He sees your pillow that's filled with tears at night, and he is the God who sees, and he is the God that is working on your behalf behind the scenes when you don't even know. And because of the gospel and the gift of the cross and the gift of heaven, we have that living hope that we can run to. And I think... And I think this is just important to share this one detail when you talk about the hope of heaven. Um, 2,641 days ago was when I said goodbye to Lindsay. And I can look at it as that 2,641 days passed away from her or I'm 2,641 days closer to her. The hope of heaven changes everything. Our perspective from looking back to looking forward. I don't want us to look at this as hopeless, but as hopeful. So really, we, we've, got, we've got two next steps that, that we think can begin to offer hope in the midst of hurt. Uh, if you're here and you do not know Jesus, and I'm talking about epinosis, not you haven't heard of him, but you don't have a relationship with him, you don't walk with him, you don't have his hope that he's offered. You're not 2,641 days closer to anyone in your soul because you're not even sure that if you died, you would spend an eternity in heaven. We want to use this service to introduce you to Jesus and give you an opportunity to say yes to him. However, that is not the end of your spiritual journey. Um, The women in my life this year, um, the three probably closest women in my life, my mother, uh, my wife, and my assistant, Michelle, have all lost. My mother um, lost her dad this spring. Michelle lost her father in January. Danielle lost her opa, her grandpa, two weeks ago. Um, They all know Jesus, so are they good? No. They now need the hope and the ministry of Jesus and his people. So if you're you're here and you're a Christian, you're like, I know Jesus, so I guess there's nothing left for me. No, actually, maybe your journey's just beginning because you're willing to walk to your grief so you can go through your grief. Inside your bulletin, probably the most important next step of this ministry day at Journey is this little card that has a QR code on it that they're going to put on the screen behind me. For those of you like me who don't understand QR codes, there's a pin somewhere you can write your name on the back of this. Um, One of the few places in the world I never bring my phone to is into church, so this wouldn't work for me. Um, But if you have your phone and you've been trying to go, trying to get over grief without going through grief, it doesn't work that way. What our church is offering is a free grief workshop. One of the elders of our church, Jeff O'Dell, who's a professional grief counselor, is going to be leading a grief workshop on Saturday, December 3rd from 9 a.m. to noon. And he is just going to help people begin their journey through grief and to the other side of grief. If you are carrying heartache that you've never walked through, this is your next step. You can take a picture on your phone and sign up. You can take it off the screen. Um, If you don't, like me, know the QR code, take this card to our Connection Center and say, I want to go to this. I don't know how to do it that way. That's what I would do, and we could help you do it. Could you all have made it? Two questions. Could you all have made it without going through counseling and having a professional walk with you? And, And how did counseling serve you, and how does it continue to serve you as you walk through this process with Christian counselors? Yeah. Uh, can you make it through? Maybe. But do you want to make it through limping and barely getting through and trying to figure it out on your own? Or do you want to have wise counsel speaking truth over you and giving you guidance? I think one of the most valuable things that a person can do is help guide you on this journey that understands the word, understands the process. And so you may be able to make it, but I don't think that anybody wants to just make it you want to go through it and steward well what you've been given. And so for us, that has absolutely been a huge part of our personal journeys, our marriage, um, and in our family and our children specifically, walking them through. They're going to ask questions that you may not think of or be too scared to answer on your own. So I would absolutely, uh, you know, one of the challenges is typically 
the cost of a yep. of counseling and the fact that you just said that you're going to have it here available free for everybody to come to if you can figure out how to scan a QR code or ask a question <laughs> that's unbelievable I wish every church offered that so with a wholehearted yes it is absolutely a difference maker in your journey yeah, I just think that it's such a gift. So often we think in the midst of our pain because we have our perspective clouded by our situation and people around us are very emotionally invested. So they can't often speak truth because they're hurting too. So to have somebody that can say, you know, this is what the word says or this that's actually not healthy what you think is healthy or telling your kids to do this is actually not good or whatever is such a gift to be able to walk through it. We had a counselor that literally I still talk to on a regular basis and walked us through some really hard days and was the prayer warrior behind us and it was such a an amazing gift. So what a great access that you have that to your church family. So I think I, I told our elders as we prayed this morning before church, this service should have two major impacts. One, there will be people who are hurting in our congregation today. And I pray we've been able to minister to you and show you both the gnosis, the promises of God's word that you're going to make it and a picture of people who've made it. But that's not most of us. But all of us, second impact, we know someone suffering and hurting right now. We've been watching it, some of us up close, some of it from a distance, and we've not, we just don't know what to do. And I think today we've learned just a little bit more how to maybe step into that so that they don't have to walk alone. The way we close our services at Journey is by thinking about what we've heard and trying to respond spiritually. Even if you're not a Christian, you've never been to church, we're going to make it real easy for you to have kind of a prayerful meditation moment because the Bible tells us to not just be hearers of the word. Hey, I heard a message pretty cool, but to do like to be doers, to go do something about it. So at the end of our service, we have a three minute window where we ask three questions. They'll be on the screen scrolling. There'll be a three minute clock that ticks down every minute. A new question will come up and we'll ask you to ask the question to yourself and then answer it. But if this works correctly, the answer will come from the Holy Spirit, which means it literally is a breath of prayer. So I want you to focus on the answer. And then as you answer that question, just begin to have a conversation with God about your answer. That's as simple as prayer is. At the end of that three minutes, I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you who are in the room. You maybe not started a relationship with Jesus, an opportunity to say yes and to begin the first step of any healing in life. And then I'm going to ask Daniel to pray over the men in our room. I'm going to ask Brittany to pray over the ladies in our room. And then we'll end today. And as people dismiss, Daniel and Brittany are going to come down front. Our spiritual care team will come down front. And we won't leave the room until you're done talking with us um, and allowing us to minister to you. So I'm going to say a quick prayer. And then our prayer reflections are going to come. Spend this three minutes listening to the Holy Spirit, talking to God. And then we'll close in prayer afterward together. God, thank you for what we've heard today. Holy Spirit. Allow our hearts to answer these questions honestly. And as we just talk to you about it, allow prayer to be the result of our soul moving through the information we've learned and moving it vertical towards heaven. That's our prayer. And Lord, we ask that you be with us in this three minutes now. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you've not yet begun your spiritual journey by connecting to Jesus, we'd love, love to allow you the opportunity to do that today. The Bible says when you hear the gospel, you hear the good news of who God is and how he loves you and how he provided his son to forgive your sin and to send his spirit to give you peace and to give you his word for direction. That if you surrender living life your way and you begin to live life his way, you surrender your past to his grace and your future to his leadership, that he literally will change you from the inside out. The Bible calls it salvation. Scripture says if you believe that in your heart, that God sent Jesus to the cross for your sin, but then he raised him from the dead for your life. If you believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. Say, what does that mean? It means you begin in your soul to really believe there's a God in heaven who loves you, knows you, and wants to be close to you. And you respond to that invitation with, yes, I, if that's true, I want to be close to you too. You believe it in your heart. Then you confess it with your mouth. That means you pray and you'll be saved. You acknowledge what your heart is feeling. So I'd like to, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, but you believe God brought you here today so you could begin that process, I'd like to lead you in a prayer that will allow you to complete that cycle of believing and confessing. So would you just bow your heads with me quickly? We won't linger long. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if Jesus has already called your heart to salvation, you already believe the God of the universe sees you, knows you, loves you, wants to live in relationship with you then you can confess with your mouth what your heart already feels, that you believe it and you want to receive it. If you don't know the words of a prayer that would make sense to you, you can repeat after me. You don't have to pray out loud. You don't even have to move your lips. From your heart to heaven, you can just say something like this. Tell God what your heart is feeling. Maybe pray something like this. You can repeat after me. God, my heart is telling me that I need you. And God, your word tells me that you love me and are willing to receive me. So today by, today by faith, which means I don't understand it all, but my heart is being drawn to you. Today by faith, I receive your invitation to be connected to you and loved by you through the life and death of your son, Jesus. Forgive me for my sin. I'm sorry for living life for myself. Cleanse me of my past. Give me a clean slate as I move forward. Heal me of my hurts that others in life have brought on me and lead me into my future. Today I receive Jesus as my Savior and I commit my best to follow him as my leader. Today I want to become a Christian and walk with you. If you just prayed that prayer with me in just a second, I'll let you know how you can tell us so that we can follow up with you and answer any questions that you might have. But just before we close today, I'm going to ask Daniel to pray over the men of our church, and I'm going to ask him to pray over a specific group of men, those right now who are suffering and hurting or those who are trying to lead their family, friends, co-workers through suffering and hurting, that God may give them a story that matters and opportunities for ministry. Daniel, would you pray for our men? And then when he's done, Brittany, would you pray the same thing over our ladies today? Heavenly Father, for the men in this room, my brothers in Christ that are currently in it, Lord, they are going through it. I pray that you would surround them uh, with encouragers, with truth tellers, with um, others to remind them of your word, help them to have the courage to step back into reading your word, to learn from your word and to depend on it. I pray, Lord, that they are courageous to say, Lord, I am still here. I have purpose and I have faith that you are not done with me. There's more to come. Help them be reminded of that truth that they have breath in their lungs and there is purpose ahead. Help them understand that generations to come uh, are depending on on their response, that are watching their response and what they do now, what they do here will impact eternity. We love you, Lord. I pray for comfort, for courage, uh, for hope over their life. I pray that you surround them with voices of truth and they go out of this service more confident in what you've called them to, more capable of what you've called them to through your strength. We love you, Father, and we thank you so much for this moment for these men. 
Jesus, Lord, I just lift up my sisters in Christ, God, the ones walking through suffering, the ones that have an empty seat at their table this season, God, the ones that are walking through a story that they didn't want or ones that are wanting a story that they don't have. God, I pray in any situation of suffering or hurt, betrayal, weakness, sickness, disease, loss, grief. God, that you would just enter in their pain in an amazing way, Father. May your presence just surround them, Lord, like a shield. God, I pray that they would hide under the shadow of the Almighty and find refuge and strength in you, God. I pray that you would work in a mighty way, that they would know that you are the God who sees them, that you are the God who is with them, and that they are never alone. God, Emmanuel, God with us, would you come? Would you be with them this season, Jesus? May they see that you care and that you love them, God. We just ask that you would do the healing work that only you can do. God, time doesn't heal, but you heal. And you have the power to break through the chains of pain, unforgiveness, resentment, self-pity, whatever it is that we are struggling and that we are carrying the weight, God. We give that weight to you, the burden lifter, Jesus. And we pray that you would work in a way that only you can do for your glory, for your power, and for our good, Jesus. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Journey, could you thank Daniel and Brittany for coming again and sharing their story with us? Guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give me 60 seconds. Don't don't get up and move around yet. Um, our grief workshop, December 3, we'd love for you to be a part. You can click the QR code. If you're a first-time guest today, don't forget to let us know. The connection card in the seat pocket in front of you allows you to have impact uh, on a refugee family from Ukraine. If you'll turn that in at the Connection Center, uh, we'll make a donation on your behalf to help families there. If you made a spiritual decision today, that same connection card can be taken to the Connection Center. They'll give you some resources about following Jesus. Michelle, I'm going to call a little bit of an audible here. I'm going to have you take Daniel and Brittany out to the Connection Center. So we've got a family being baptized after church, and I know people are going to want to talk to them for a little bit. Our spiritual care team will be down front. If you need prayer, if you need counsel, if you have questions, we won't leave until you're done with us. Um, If you want to say hey to Daniel and Brittany, um, connect with them briefly. They'll be at our Connection Center um, out there with Michelle, uh, and they will stay and talk to you until they don't have anybody else to talk to them. That is their favorite part of ministering at a church. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. It has been a great Sunday. We hope to see you next Sunday. If you're traveling, be safe, Um, and it's going to be a great holiday season. Season at Journey. You are dismissed. Thanks for being with us today.